All right, Matthew chapter 16. Now, if there's a doctrine you never heard about is demon possession, and not only that, that it can happen to saved Christians. You might say, why is that? It's because uh, the devil, what he possesses is not your soul, but your flesh. The flesh is capable of sinning and committing wickedness. If you don't believe in that, then uh, you must have a very good life. If you struggle with uh, certain things in your life, if you backslide or grow colder, what happens is the sinful addiction becomes stronger. And the tendency to slack off in Bible reading, prayer, church attendance, and etc. becomes greater. And what happens is then if you're in the wrong environment, they distort your thinking and you can change your beliefs in Christianity. And you can become very wicked and the heart can be so much filled with sinful flesh that you can't even recognize the same person anymore. That practically the devil possesses his body and his mind. So that is very uh, possible on what happens. But I believe there is a greater threat than that. I believe that there is a greater threat than demon-possessed Christians. Dr. Altman preached a sermon about demon-possessed Christians, and a great example is Peter here. Notice that he's a safe person, but the devil possessed him. Look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be afar from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, who? Satan. Satan was speaking through Peter when he said that. So notice how he possessed him. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. <clears throat> Now, the reason why say, uh, Peter fell into Satan's possession, and not only that, I would dare say that a lot of Christians fall into Satan's temptations. Not only that, I'll even say why the whole world is going through the problems right now is because of what Eve messed up in. There was something she and majority of Christians and Peter messed up in, and it's not demon possession. It's demon delusion. Demon delusion. What do I mean by that? It's the very thing that caused Eve to sin and everyone else to become eventually demon possessed or face demon possession sometime in their life. Because if Eve, she already knew about the fruit. She already knew about the consequences. But there was something she didn't keep in mind. The reason why she fell into that trap was because she did not believe or did not really think about, there is a devil. The serpent was the one that caught her and told her to eat the fruit from off the tree. If Eve knew about the serpent, if she was aware and prepared, she would have avoided the temptation altogether and perhaps not eaten the fruit off the tree. And that's the same thing with Christians, is the reason why they mess up in their lives and the reason why they go through struggles and problems is they don't think about one thing. Hey, you ever thought about that there is a devil? Why do bad things happen to me? Because there is a devil. Why is the world so attractable and I want to do it? Because there is a devil. Why is it that I have to go through hardship in this church and problems happen in this church and I have to get along with people and their splits? Because there is a church. Why do good Bible-believing pastors mess up and good Bible believers mess up? Because there is a devil. That's your problem. You don't think about, you don't really believe. Some of you might think you believe, but you really don't. You don't believe there is a devil in every situation that happens. And when you think about that, you'd be more aware, more armed. And then the complaint will die out. And then the motivation and the service for God will increase tenfold. And that's what you need to do. But you became deluded. You think the devil's a delusion. You don't really see him there in the situation you're going through. You don't see his system, his plan and his setup and everything. And that's the reason why you keep messing up. You don't really believe there is a devil, perhaps. The title of my message today is not Demon Possessed Christians. It's Demon Deluded Christians. Let's pray. Father God, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood as I preach uh, your word. This is a sermon that the devil won't like, but it's a needful sermon. It's a needed sermon. 
And I pray that it will help us and change our lives so much. It will be eye-opening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, my first point is deluded in allures. Deluded in allures. Now, the thing is, is that Satan, he wants to uh, delude you where you don't see his working, his power, and his thing behind the scenes when you're attracted to the allures of this life. You know, there's a common complaint is, why won't God allow me to have fun in life? Why is this, why can't I do well in this job? You know, I have to skip these things in church. The reason why is because I've gotten more preoccupied with something important, whether it be uh, school, whether it be a job, whether it be family, or, you know, I've got things going on in my life. And then in the worldly life and the worldly successes, why is that considered sin? Why does pastor have to say, this is a sin, that's a sin, I can't do this, I can't watch that, I can't say this, and I can't dress up that way, and I can't hear this thing, and why is it all that way? Simple. You know what it is? There is a devil. You don't think about that. If there is a devil, what would he do? He would make that candy look so delectable. He would make that allure ten times greater than what your imagination can unfold. The devil will make it seem, make sin seem innocent. You don't think about that. You blame the pastor. You blame God. Why don't you blame on the devil? You're the devil's best friend. Accusing God and then his ministers and then... His word on, hey, this is sin, that's wrong. Stay away from the world, that's wrong. You need to stay clean. But then the complaint comes out. Oh, why do I have to do that? I don't understand why this is sin. And why can't I just maintain my job? Why can't I just have a comfortable life? Why, you're asking too much of me, Lord. Uh, you're asking too much of me, preacher. You know, I can't dedicate myself to come to church and... You know, what's wrong with drinking a little bit? Then you justify drinking. Then you justify contemporary music. Then you justify, you know, the sins that other Christians are doing. There's such a thing called drinking in moderation, they'll say. Yes. You know, oh, you know, we don't dress up like Mormons in church. You come as you are. Yeah. We're a non-denominational church. You know, you know why they do that? And then they accuse you of legalism. They accuse you of no love. And they accuse you of being too stiff-necked and self-righteous and pharisaical. You know what their problem is? They don't think that there is a devil in the world. That there is a devil that offers uh, worldly allures. That there is a devil that wants to seep in the world into your life, into your thought, into your heart, if not even in the church. So if you get away with it in church and you behave, you don't become worldly, but when you go at home in your own life, there the preacher don't bother you. There people don't judge you. And you feel like that you can do whatever you want and get away with it. You know what your problem is? You don't think there is a devil. There is a devil. You don't believe he exists? You're deluded. You never see a devil when you listen to that worldly music. When you look at that worldly image. When you hang around with the worldly friends. You don't see a devil in there. You're deluded. You're like Eve. You just listen to the hissing of the serpent and eat the fruit off the tree rather than being aware, hey, that serpent's right in front of me. Right. You know, you think that you can get away with the world? You think that, oh, why can't God let me live in the world? It's too painful to sacrifice. It's too painful to separate. It's too painful to live a holy life. Why do I have to give up these things in the world? Guess what? You're going to pay a terrible price either way. You're going to go through pain either way. You either go through pain with the devil or you can go through pain serving the Lord. Either way, you have to pay a price. You think you're comfortable. You think you got it made, but you overlook those times where the Lord was chastising you, where those worldly allures seeped you in into something darker, where it made you more backslidden, where your prayers haven't been answered and hindered, where you felt more oppressed. You haven't felt uh, the joy of the Lord and peace. See, you're going through pain. You're just filling in the pain with all the void of the world. That's what's going on. But me, I gave up the world and then the void that fills in my heart with the peace and love and joy of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do I go through misery? Do I go through pain? Do I have to sacrifice? Do I have to feel like that I lose fun in life and that uh, I cannot do all these things, smoking, drinking, dancing, fornicating, and cussing and etc.? Amen. 
uh, that might be my sacrifice, but at least I don't have to sacrifice my peace, my joy, yeah, and then my blessing in the Lord and my reward and my heavenly uh, eternal inheritance. Amen. Amen. But you're willing to sacrifice, and, uh, sacrifice those things for the temporary comforts of the world that fill in the void every time. See, you have, to, you have to go through pain either way. You know what? No one likes pain. Everyone goes through pain. Whether you sin or whether you live right, you have to go through pain. You live in sin, you go through the pain of the consequences of your sin and the vanity and the temporary state of it. If you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, you go through the pain of sacrifice and criticism for him. You go through pain either way. But guess what? Everyone goes through pain in life. And guess what? Even with something new and exciting that you like to do in life, guess what? It's pain. Even things that you love to do, you have to go through something painful. If there's a job that you like to do and you want to do it, guess what? Don't say that there's no pain in that. There's going to be time you go through sleepless nights. There's going to be times when... You're going to have to struggle. There's going to be time where you're going to have deadlines. There's going to be times when money runs out. There's going to be times you have to put your effort into it. There's going to be times you're going to have competition. Pain's everywhere. Pain's everywhere. Even something that you love to do. Things that are exciting to you. Everyone goes through pain in life. But the thing is, is that people, as Bible-believing Christians, if there's something that you really love then you don't focus on the pain. You're too immersed in something that you love. What's that? It's the Word of God. It's prayer. It's coming to church. It's fellowship and all that. If you don't find something to love in there, you better start to love it. Why? Because when you fall in love with this Word and prayer and coming to church and soul winning and start to do stuff like that, when criticisms happen, when hardships happen, long distances happen, they don't really bother you as much. That's right. That's why you're going to be like some of our other brothers here who are going to drive two hours to come over here. Yeah. Through the rain. That's good, That's good. And some people can drive for 10 minutes over here. Ooh. You know, it's because you love something too much that you can go through it. Not only that, it can be something where you just endure it because you're seeing the prize at the end. You might, go, uh, you might suffer sacrifice of friends, worldly possession, worldly things, and sinful things. But guess what? You're not looking at those possessions. You're looking at the heavenly possessions. And when you keep looking at that end prize, those things seem very little to you. It's like running a marathon, despite of how much you pant, and sometimes you want to give up, and then just want to throw in the towel. You know, you ignore that pain. You just push yourself because you're seeing that end prize at the end, that I accomplish something, that I win that trophy at the end. That's what they do. You endure it because you see the end prize. Do you believe in that? That there is a prize at the end? God's blessings far outnumber beyond your imagination. But you have to endure it and you have to keep seeing it. Another thing why you'll have to go through the pain, which is important, is you need some experience of pain in your life. Why? So you can develop maturity. If you have no maturity in your life, then any pain you go through, you're going to feel like that you crack down and you can't take it and you give up. Right. But the more you take in pain, the more you're used to it because you develop experience with it. Right. And then when future pain happens, it's just going to rub off your shoulder. And then you become strong and then you're going to become stronger. And why? Because wisdom develops on how to handle the pain. You, maturity develops and strength develops. Now, when I go through hardships uh, in some of the things in the church, I've learned to handle like four problems in one day and still enjoy a good day. Yeah. You might say, how do you do that? Because I went through so much pain already. I experience. Yeah. When you experience so much, these things rub off on you and you become stronger and you become a better leader of your own life. You don't have to be a leader of a group, your own life. Yeah. A better manager and operator of things of your own life, your own household. You have to go through pain either way. But you can either go through pain with the devil. You can dance with the devil and go through pain and keep on to those worldly allures. And guess what? Fill in that void all you want. You're not going to run away. Pain will come to you. Either you face the pain and experience it and then develop that strength and then fight it out and keep looking at that prize and have something that you love, which is Jesus Christ, and then just go through it. Amen. 
You only have two options. Second point is diluted in adversities. Diluted in adversities. You know, there's a delusion in the Christian mind where they don't see a devil. They see too much trial. They see too much hardship. Uh, it's hard to come to church. It's hard to serve Jesus Christ because people make fun of me. It's a long drive. Uh, I got problems going on in my family. It's easier to just divorce and get it over with. It's easier to just go to a therapist and psychologist. It's easier to just give up my children to public school so that I can get a break. It's hard to uh, pay off my bills, to pay uh, for my children to have good schooling under a Christian background. It's hard to try to discipline my children to make sure they have good Christian education and good Christian environment. It's hard to sacrifice some of my own pleasures to consider about my significant other, my spouse. It's so hard to do that, serving God. It's so hard with the money situation here in the Bay Area to keep serving Jesus Christ, to keep helping out the church. You know what your problem is? You don't think there is a devil. There is a devil. You know, this is the devil's playground. We're in the heart of hell itself right here. If this is the heart of hell right here, don't you think it's going to be hard to serve God in the Bay Area? Don't you think that there's a suffering's going to be expected for your children, for yourself? You have to put extra effort to raise your children right. You have to put an extra effort to save it, your marriage. You have to put an extra effort to come to church. You have to put an extra effort where you have to watch your health. You have to balance your life. Look through your schedule and try to balance out your workplace, your studies, and then uh, your time in the church, and then time with your family. And then now you have to drive the long distance and you have to save up money. Guess what? Th welcome to Christian warfare. Well, I don't like that. Why does God have to make it so hard? You're so easy to blame God. Why don't you think about the devil? This is his territory. You think that it's going to be easy? That you can just get a little a toothpick and stab the devil with it? You need the whole armor of God. And you have to fight and swing a double-edged sword to cut that dragon because that dragon's armor is thick if your armor is not. And you have to fight it out when suffering happens. Well, you know, when I get involved in helping out this church, there's just too much trouble that happens and the devil suddenly attacks. What did you expect? A non-denominational church where it's all queasy and nice and everything's comfortable and the devil won't bother bothering you? Or did you expect a Bible-believing church that's kicking the devil's home and basically we're that noisy neighbor in his backyard, street preaching, don't burn in hell, and waking up the devil in the middle of the night? What did you expect? You think he's going to leave you alone? Suffering, of course, happens. Health problems, criticism, financial troubles, church problems, etc. It happens. It happens. You know what your problem is? You don't believe there is a devil. You don't see there is a devil. And you need to see that. Well, I don't want it. Well, guess what? You're gonna, you can either face suffering trying to serve the Lord or face suffering with the devil's lies. Oh, yeah, you can run away from this suffering, that suffering, and then run away from this hardship, that hardship. But guess what? You won't escape suffering. You won't escape pain. And not only that, you already have an immature mindset. For example, let's say that you have that immature mindset where you can't rescue your household and your family. And then uh, the Bible-believing church teaches you it's a sin to divorce. And you have to put in extra effort. You have to stick to your significant other. And then what happens is, well, I can't take that anymore. I divorce and I just want to get away from church. Fine, I don't have to attend this church anymore. And then guess what? Years later, you thought that what was something comfortable, what ended your suffering when you did divorce, you made it worse with your children being broken up, mentally hurt, your household broken up, and you have to go through ugly fights with uh, legal issues and legal matters, and etc. And then you become one of those 50% of the population in America who went through divorce. You know, you're going to suffer either way. You're going to suffer either way. I prefer suffering. You know, you trust the devil too much where you prefer his suffering, where you prefer the way he puts you through pain, how he treats you. You trust him too much, way more than God. I trust God more that no matter what adversity and suffering that I go through, 
that I'm going to be all right in his hand. But you sure don't believe in that, do you? You don't trust the Lord when you go through suffering. You get scared. You do things your own way. Where the devil leads you, you trust him way too much. You think you can escape from pain, dancing with the devil? No. Deluded in adjustment. That's my third point. Deluded in adjustment. You know, sometimes it's a pain to try to correct people. Uh, when you become a leader of a ministry, it is your, listen up, this is your accountability and your responsibility to make sure that if you're in charge, for example, of a children's ministry, that you make sure that you correct them. If you're a leader of a church or a pastor, you have to correct the members. Amen. You don't let things slide. You don't let sin slide. You don't let uh, worldliness slide and wrong doctrine slide. You have to correct it. But it's a pain in the neck, you know, where I have to be loving. I can't be mean. And I have to be loving, charitable, and patient. It's such a pain in the neck, Pastor. What did you expect? A mega Calvary Chapel church where you can let things slide? Or did you expect there is a devil? There is a devil. You got to realize this. The people in this, especially in this Bay Area right here, can you blame them where they've been brainwashed and programmed for many years in their wrong doctrines, in the lifestyle that they grew up in the world? And you're deprogramming all of that in just what? Once a week on Sundays when you get to see them. That's a lot of work. Oh, that's a lot of work. I can't do that. What did you expect? You don't believe there is a devil. This is his system. They were born, raised in that environment for many years to talk the way the devil teaches them to talk, to act the way the devil teaches them to act, to believe the wrong stuff the way that they were taught to believe, that LGBTQ and X, Y, and Z is all okay. They were taught to believe that. They were taught to believe that pre this kind of preaching is too mean and harsh and cruel and they don't really love you. What did you expect? And it's your job to deal with these kind of people. If you're given a position to adjust people, you have to adjust them. Oh, man, I don't want... Uh, but you can't be mean about it. You can't be unwise about it. And man, oh, man, that's so annoying. Hey, what did you expect? This is the devil's system. You have to be patient. You have to be charity. And you have to take a stand at the same time. Oh, it's so hard. Hey, what did you expect? This is the devil's system. You're not paying attention. There is a devil. It takes balance, patience, and endurance to correct the person and to adjust the person in the right step. That's why parents are slacking off in the way they raise their children. It's your job to correct them, to adjust them in the right path. And it's hard, especially in this day and age where they're combined with the media generation. Hey, that's your job. You have to adjust them. Ah, oh, but I tried and they don't listen. Did you pray? Maybe it's on your part. You're not showing enough charity. Maybe you're not understanding where they come from. Oh, but that's too much extra. What, what did you expect? There is a devil. You have to put in extra effort. You have to put in extra love, extra patience. Because this is the devil's system. Why do I have to correct people? Then don't correct people. What happens? Then the next generation gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Let's see you be happy after that. Imagine these pastors with these mega church, thousands of people. You know how they go through uh, with people having problems going on and scandals going on in church and worldliness and sin on the rise? They just ignore it. They run away from it. You can't, hey, but guess what? You can't hide forever. And when, the, when it's time where they have to correct and adjust the situation, it's already too late. They ruined their testimony. You know why? Because you have to pay the devil one day if you dance with him. If you dance with the devil in, well, I don't want to correct people. You know, I tried and I tried and I just give up. No. Dance with the devil then. You have to pay him one day. And the people you fail to adjust in your life, that's a husband adjusting the wife. You're a leader in the home, you have to correct your wife. If you're a pastor, you have to correct your church. If you're a, mother, if you're a parent, you have to correct your child. That is the job. And who likes that? 
I don't like it, but hey, who likes it? You think I like it? I don't like my job. I have to, you know, I have to correct the people in my church in the Bay Area. And then I have to correct my wife. And then I have to correct uh, the children over here. And then I, you think my job, and I have to correct onliners of all things. Why don't you take my job then? Welcome to life. What, why, Pastor? Why do you have to do that? Because there is a devil. And I'm tangling and I'm fighting him in the online world. I'm fighting him in the Bay Area. I'm fighting him in my home and in my church. So it's expected. Why can't you just leave it well enough alone? If I leave it well enough alone, then can I live with a clean conscience of thousands burning in hell if I give up online? Can I live with a clean conscience of people living wrecked lives and ruining their own walk and then I'm held accountable for them at the judgment seat of Christ? Can I do that if I have children and a wife and then I'm held accountable for them at the judgment seat of Christ and they ruin their testimony in the eyes of the church? Guess what? There is a devil. That's my job. That's your job. There is a devil. And you have to do it. You have to do it. Then don't do it. Don't do it. Dance with the devil. You have to face pain either way. You can go through the pain of going through the ire and the wrath of people. Or you can go through the ire and wrath of the, cons the consequences of sin and the judgment of God. What would I prefer? My fourth point is deluded in accountability. Deluded in accountability. You know, uh, if you're given a position or a job, all right, in the workplace, it's common sense. You have to do well in the workplace. You know, th they change even to the dress code sometimes. You know that, right? Like if you're a waiter at a restaurant, sometimes you'll have to even do that sometimes. Whether the, the smallest measly job or the highest position, you have to do ridiculous things and you don't want to follow it, but guess what? You have to so that you can get paid. Why? Because of accountability accountability you're representing the workplace and you can't think that about your christian walk you can't think that about church you know you sooner you sooner you never skip a uh school class or you can uh you would wake up early for job but you can't do that for church you can't do that with prayer and bible reading you know what your problem is you don't take accountability of your christian life your behavior, your attitude, the way you talk, your manners. Yeah, manners is in the Bible. Well, that's not how I am. The Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. Manners is in the Bible. And what you're accountable to do. You think that God's appreciative when you forget to do things? It's easy for me to do that as a pastor. A lot of times I forget. You see that. But guess what? I'm accountable for that. So I have to... I can't tell you the number of times I had to apologize. I have to make right for it. I have to do 10 times better. I have to fill out my schedule all the time. And so I'm always constantly busy. Why? Because I'm accountable. And I take my job seriously. Do you take your job seriously for the Lord? Are you given in charge of the ministry things to do? And you have to be held accountable for that. You have to do it well. To break down easily, get depressed, complain and whine easily when you're given charge over something for the Lord, you fail in being accountable. You fail in being mature. Guess what? There's so much private pain that I go through in my life, but I don't parade it to you. Quite often I do an unspoken prayer request. Guess what? If you're held accountable over something in the church or in serving God, you don't whine, you don't cry about it. You take in the pain, you go through it. You don't think, oh, woe is me, this is too hard. What did you expect? There is a devil. And he's going to make sure that your job is so hard for you. And you got a tough job. You know what your job is? Fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. Of course there's a lot of accountability for that. And that's why you have to behave right, talk right. Why? Because you're held accountable. You can't be forgetful, negligent over your duties. You got to make sure everything is done right. Why? Because what a bad testimony you'll be if we compare ourselves with other churches. You know why? Because you're negligent about there is a devil. You don't believe there is a devil. 
You don't believe that the devil, I mean, as soon as you guys came to church, you don't believe the devil is going to attack that video camera, the tech. How easy it is to forget that and to just think about just teaching and preaching and just fellowshipping. Oh, it's not a big deal if I forget to bring a food or bring water or, you know, come to church late. Do you take your accountability seriously? And if you don't, did you ever stop to think there is a devil? Because I'll tell you what, his servants and his slaves, the devil's slaves are more faithful. They wake up earlier in the morning. They come to, church, they come to their church on time. They do their street preaching and soul winning about sodomite rights agenda more debt, more, more, with more commitment than you do. They're more brave. They're more bold. Well, it's too much accountability. I can't do that in my hand. Then go serve the devil. Dance with the devil. See what happens when you're not responsible, when you are negligent, when you are ignorant, when you're not faithful in your duties to serve God. You don't think the devil's... Uh, not going to get you one way or the other. Dance with the devil. I dare you. And guess what? You will go through pain. Everything in life is painful. It's inevitable in life. I prefer to go it under the hand of God rather than the hand of the devil. My fifth point is deluded in accusations. Deluded in accusations. You know, there's a delusion going on in Christians' mind. Whenever they see me teach and preach, you know what? Guess what? I say... Signs, healing, and wonders, they're not, from, they're not biblical. They're from the devil. And then people get easily offended and mad. Why? Why? I mean, I'm quoting from the scripture. I'm doing what God commanded me to do. Why won't they still believe it? Simple. They don't believe there is a devil. How, how can Satan use signs, healing, and wonders in my experience? I know what I felt. I saw Jesus. I felt Jesus. You don't think Satan can use that. You're deluded. I mean, uh, you don't believe that the devil can use the Bible. You know that? No, not the word of God. It's so sacred. It's so holy. No, the devil can use the Bible. You never read Matthew 4, did you? Satan used scripture on Jesus. See, you don't think that Satan can't, you think that Satan can't take what is holy and pure and use it for his means. Can I repeat that again? You don't believe Satan can take what is holy and pure and use it for his means. That's your problem. He made 300,000 holy Bibles. Different modern Bible versions. You don't believe there is a devil. Why do you accuse and criticize, you know, about the liberal agenda? You know, I mean, the Republicans have their problem too. So, you know, it's, it's the Republicans. They have this fault and that fault. You don't believe there is a devil. You're all looking at humanity and tolerance and what the minorities and sodomites and the people are going through. So much unfairness and oppression and because you're so blinded and infatuated with that, you don't see the devil using the strings, yeah. invisible strings as a puppet. I'm building up a socialist, communist system. You don't believe there is a devil. You know why you walk away from this church and get mad? You know, he's accusing this. He's accusing that. Pastor just accused me of this kind of thing in his preaching. And you don't believe there is a devil that just possessed your mind. Demon delusion leads to demon possession. You don't believe there is a devil tempting, putting that in your heart. And then because of that, you listen to that adversary whispering in your ear. And then he just possessed your mind and your heart and body. And then you walked out mad. You don't believe there is a devil. There is a devil. You know, why do you criticize everything? You know, I love Jesus Christ. I don't understand why you're saying that what I'm doing is wrong. I sincerely love Jesus. I practice it. I'm a good Christian. I don't know why you condemn, uh, you know, the way that I'm living for the Lord. You know, I mean, uh, the music that I'm listening, the dressing that I'm dressed up with. And then, you know, this doctrine, you know, we have our differences on, but... You know, I'm using a different Bible than you. I don't get it. That's your problem. You don't believe there is a devil to use your sincerity. That's what you onliners have a problem with. You don't believe there is a devil. 
Be unless you believe there is a devil, then you start to question yourself and say, is my, it's so simple. This is so simple. Does my belief, does my experience, does my heart, it doesn't matter what you think or feel, does it line up with the word of God? That's it. Does it line up with scripture? If it don't, you better be scared. And you better think of the possibility, could the devil be lying to me? Because what's your standard, your experience, your feeling? Not a problem for Satan. He transforms into an angel of light. The Bible says there is another Jesus. You're so arrogant. You're so mean. You blame too much on the preacher. You don't blame the devil. You're so much on the devil's side. You're so much filled with anti-God, anti-ministry, rather than anti-Satan. My sixth point, deluded in affiliations, deluded in affiliations. There's a complaint. And, you know, when you become a Bible-believing Christian, to be quite honest, you become very ruined. You become very ruined because uh, you know too much. When you grow and know the Word of God, listen up now. It's not just doctrine, it's practice, okay? In doctrine and practice, when you grow in the Word of God, what happens is this, and the affiliations that you had with good godly Christians, they, they get more distant. They get more shattered. You know, I don't know why, Pastor, you criticize John MacArthur. He took a stand against the government, you know. So I don't know why you criticize him. I don't know why you criticize Ray Comfort. He got a lot of people giving the gospel, you know, and he has so much wisdom on the streets. I don't know why you criticize Kent Hovind, you know, for believing the raptures after the tribulation. He's done so much good with creationism, defending the cause of Christ. And I don't know, see, that's your problem. You don't believe there is a devil to use good, listen up, good, godly Christians who might be better people than me. You don't believe in that. No, I don't believe in that. Oh, yeah? You want me to give you proof right here? All right. King David, man after God's own heart, right? Guess what? I can show you thousands of atheists who hate God that didn't commit the sin of murder. But David, a man after God's own heart, committed murder. Oh, so, you know, does that justify? And no, he sinned. You know what? The devil can use good, godly people who are much better than a lot of lost, unsaved people. Yes, yes. You're deluded in your affiliations. When you affiliate yourself with uh, fellow good, godly Christians, guess what? You better believe, listen up now, you better believe there is a devil who can start to put in a dissension and then start to influence wrongly somebody. And if you don't believe in that, one day you'll be that person who walks out mad out of church and give up your Christianity because your good, godly, Bible-believing pastor has committed a scandal. Can I repeat that again? It's not just one. There's so many, right? There's so many others that uh, happen. I can point you out Bible-believing pastors who messed up with something. But I'm not going to tell you. You don't believe there is a devil. You don't believe there is a devil. I don't mean to scare you, but you don't believe the devil could use me. You don't believe the devil could use Sheila. You don't believe the devil could use Robert Randall. You don't believe the devil could use Brother Max. You don't believe the devil can use Daniel Seeley. You don't believe the devil could use you because you're so good and godly. You're so deluded. You're so deluded. You know what? There is a devil. That's why I don't hang around with independent fundamental Baptist Christian churches. You might say, oh, why, why? You think you're better than them? No, because I know what happens when I go with them. Then my members get influenced by those people's members in churches, and they'll recommend some preachers that I don't recommend, even some Calvinist ones, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah. And then they'll water them down. They'll, then they'll start to uh, critique street preaching. I know the independent fundamental Baptist crowd. They'll critique street preaching. They'll critique going deeper into doctrine. And they'll say about unloving spirit. And then they'll shatter your dispensationalism one by one. I know that crowd. You know, that's why I don't hang around that. Why? Because my people, souls are too precious to me here. 
So I want to give you good people. Amen. Now, Bible-believing pastors, we're all imperfect people. I'm not saying that they're perfect and I'm perfect. We're all imperfect. We're all different. But, if I, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go as low as I can. I'm not going to go this low. Independent fundamental Baptist is that low compared to Bible believer. There's still a huge gap. So I'm going to still do what I can. Why? To protect my church. But there are pastors who aren't doing that. Why? They don't believe there is a devil in affiliations to water down Christians. Let's water down. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking away your King James Bible or dispensationalism or your street preaching or your good godly living. I, I'm just watering it down a bit. Oh, I know. I know what I'm talking about. I've been through fellowships. I know that. They water it down a bit. You know what's the devil's job is? To water it down. To get you as, he doesn't care if you go one inch to sin. He just wants you to sin, period. Whether one inch or ten miles into sin. You're deluded. You don't think there is a, there is a Satan in independent, fundamental, Baptist, King James only churches. You don't believe there is a devil. Guess what? There is a devil behind Gene Kim. There can be a devil behind Jack Treber. There can be a devil behind Doug Fisher. There can be a devil behind Paul Chapel. There can be, what, am I scaring you? I included myself here. I'm no better than these men. Some of these men are better than me. What am I trying to point out? In affiliations, you have to see a devil behind it. And that's why some of the, uh, so, like, I get onliners. Why don't you recommend this guy? He's a Bible believer, and he does stuff on the whiteboard and stuff like that because I believe there's a devil in affiliations. That's why. Because the devil used some people that I know of who call themselves Bible believers, but they ruined the churches around them and other Bible-believing pastors. That's why I don't hang around them. You know why? You don't believe there's a devil that can use a Bible-believing pastor Watch yourself. You're in a delusion. You think Satan's going to tempt everybody, those who are in wrong doctrine, those who are apostate Christians, those who are lost, wicked government and liberals, but not Bible-believing Christians. No, you don't believe there is a devil. What you're going to find out is this. Go to every Bible-believing pastor, Bible-believing churches. Guess what? Their fellowships and their fe the people they choose to fellowship, the people they choose to separate is all different. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because they knew a devil in something that happened. So they can't fellowship with certain people. But other Bible-believing pastors can. Why? Because they didn't experience the devil in that situation. Same thing with churches. Okay, you don't believe it? Bible believers in churches, they, if the, uh, when the devil used them in one particular Bible-believing church, guess what? They moved to a different Bible-believing church. And over there, the devil didn't really use them over there. That happens. There's a devil in affiliations. All right, seventh point, deluded in assemblies. Deluded in assemblies. You know, you're under a delusion that, uh, man, I don't understand why I have to help out the church more. You know, why do I have to get along with people? Why do I have to attend the fellowship? And, you know, they got enough people over there. Why do I have to be the one? And, uh, hey, you don't believe there is a devil. Oh, with me, it's just one. And see, that's your problem. The devil, all he needs is one. Because why? He gets 10 other ones who thought the same thing like you. You don't believe there is a devil. Yeah, I make a big deal about trying to come here as early as I can. Even if I'm like a few minutes late, I make a big deal out of that. Now, I don't make it paranoid where like, oh, I just committed the unpardonable sin and it's the end of the world. I don't do it that way. But I take myself seriously in trying to attend everything, in trying to participate everything, involve everything. You might say, why is that? Because I believe there is a devil. I believe there is a devil. He doesn't want us to assemble. He doesn't want to assemble as much. He, he wants to drop, listen, it's not just he, he doesn't want to just drop Sunday main service. You know what he wants to drop? He wants to drop street preaching on those odd days where you're not there. He wants to drop that one. And visitation. You know what he wants to drop? Just a random Zoom meeting. Ladies fellowship or uh, Randall's fellowship or the young adults fellowship. 
Just a random Wednesday night teaching. He wants to do that. There is a devil. Now, look, I'm not trying to uh, make people feel bad. I know everyone has their schedules. I have mine, too. But the thing is this, is that do you prioritize? Do you prioritize the battlefield of the Christian walk about there is a devil? And do you do that while balancing your life? If you do that, then you'll do well. All right. Even if there are some things that you skip, there are some things that I skip, too. But I try not to skip as much. You might say, why? Because I believe there is a devil. And I take assembling seriously. And you know what? I'm that person, all right, that would drive three hours to go to church. I, I did that back then years ago. I don't believe in skipping church, period. Why? Because I know there is a devil. Right, right. And one person that I don't get along in church is enough where the devil ruins the whole church. So I take it seriously. I put charity. I put understanding. I surrender the person to the Lord and let the Lord handle that person. If that person has a problem, guess what? He takes care of it every time. Know why? Because I believe there is a devil and I have to put in effort. Why? The devil want, I don't want to be the one the devil uses to ruin the church. I don't want to be the one the devil uses where I fall out of church and become the discouragement to the pastor, to the fellow brother and sister in Christ next to me. You're deluded. You don't picture, you don't re really see a devil. My eighth point is deluded in appearance, deluded in appearance. You know, the thing is this, you might separate from the world, you might take in your suffering well, you might uh, try to correct people that you're held responsible for, and you might do your responsibility, your accountability fairly well, and you try to do it faithfully. You know, you... Uh, if you have to take a stand, you critique wrong doctrine. You take a stand. You accuse the false preachers out there. And then you're very careful with your affiliations. You make sure that you don't hang around with the wrong crowd. And then when you assemble together as a church, you try to get along. You try to help out the church. But I wonder if you're deluded in all those things in not thinking about how do I appear in doing all those things. Oh, I'm not sinning, pastor, and I'm not. But does it appear that way to people? Well, I've been faithful to church, and does it appear that way to people? You know, when there was a one or two times that I came in late straight, guess what? It made the appearance where everyone thinks, I can come in late too because pastor's going to come in late. Appearance is powerful. Well, I'm not, uh, you know, the suffering and the pain that I'm going through, I'm enduring it for Jesus Christ, and I'm not whining, I'm crying about it. Does it appear that way? Well, you know, I'm trying to hang around with much Bible believers as much as possible. There are times where I might have to affiliate with some things uh, that the people are wrong about, but overall, I'm trying to do it with Bible-believing people, and that's okay. Well, that's understandable, and I do that too. Yeah, I do that too, but does it appear that way to people? You know what I do? I go like real Bible believers. I try to appear that I am all the way as a Bible believer. I'm like I'm hardcore. I go to some IFB meetings and I enjoy a good time. I, get it. I receive advice from IFB pastors. I've done that before, and I'll still do that. But people who watch me online and people who know me in my church know what kind of person I am. Why? Because I try to keep appearing that way. Why? That I'm a genuine Bible believer. I don't water down. That's the type of person that I am. So see, are all these previous points, do you appear accountable in the eyes of people? Like not forgetful, very responsible. They can depend on you. You're the first person they would call upon because they know that you do the job well. Do you appear that way? Do you appear the type of person who takes responsibility so, so well that you're able to correct and your children are raised properly? That you have a good testimony of a wife? You have a good testimony of church people because of the way that you led the home and the church and the people you're held accountable for? Does it appear that way? I'm not saying is appear. Well, why do I have to? You're so nitpicky. You're too easy to blame the preacher and the preaching. You don't blame the devil. You know what the devil's job is? To give people a distortion in their mind. Whether you believe it or not, people judge things outwardly, and you do too. 
You do too. Everyone does. And the devil, he tempts the mind and the eyes and then the heart. Puts some grand delusion that, well, that person is lazy. Well, that person is too judgmental. Well, that person is, that's what happens inevitably in people. That's why you have to appear right in the eyes of people. Why? Because I believe there is a devil. I believe there is a devil. Do you believe there is a devil? Do you, do you appear right or do you appear wrong in any of these things? And the <laughs> devil gets to you. My ninth point is deluded in aggravations. Deluded in aggravations. The last thing I want to close, and thank you for your patience, I'm going to wrap it up here, is that um, after hearing all this, the simple answer, and this is sad, I've met a few people in my life that did this, which breaks my heart, even people who are close to me, is that, look, I'm just sick and tired of all this. That's it. And they just don't care. They just don't care. I, look, I've heard enough preaching about it. I know what you're going to tell me. I know all the scripture, but I'm done. That's it. That's fine. But guess what? You won't change one irrefutable fact. Let me repeat it again. It doesn't change the fact. There is still, there's still going to be a devil. And there's still going to be a devil who will tempt you, who will make sure you pay the price, who will make sure that he gets his uh, delectable and he'll make sure that you go through pain and that he'll make sure that he gets his due. When you dance with the devil, you can't go unscathed and uncut. Yes, yes. It doesn't matter. You can say, I'm sick and tired of all this. I don't care anymore. But you won't change one irrefutable fact. There is still a devil and he'll still tempt you. He'll make sure you keep going down that dark path and he'll make you deluded and not think about him. That's the devil's greatest lie is you don't think about him so that you don't serve God well, so that, you don't, so that you can stay away from sin, so that you can make sure your appearance of a testimony of a Christian on your behavior, attitude, and everything appears right in the eyes of others. You don't see there is a devil. Now think about this. This is something to think about. You think that the way that you're going is more comfortable, more convenient, and that's where you get the joy in life, is that if, I, if all these things didn't happen, Pastor, if I can just get away from all these things and, and you know, I just want to do what I want to do, well, there's pain. It doesn't change that fact. So here's the pointer right here. If you go through the pain and overcome it, then isn't, doesn't there have to be, there has to be reward for that? There has to be peace, joy, and blessing. If all these evil things that I pointed out right here before, all these pointers I pointed out, if you are able to conquer them, overcome them, avoid these things, shouldn't you be able to live a happy life then? You should. Amen. You should be able to live, experience God's blessings, His peace and joy. And God even guaranteed and promised you have to be rewarded when you go through pain. There has to be something that comes out of that. So guess what? Why not then just uh, get it over with? Go through the pain. Get those things over with. That way you can get that peace and joy and blessing at the end. That's what you want, right? If you want that, go through it and get it. You're deluding yourself if you can get it right now. If you can do it by dancing with the devil. No, you go through pain. Is that what you really want? Out of this whole preaching, nothing sat right with you and you didn't like it. Why? Because you want something that made you feel comfortable. Something where you can be happy and have peace and blessing and joy. Guess what? You can have that. But it only happens if these evil things didn't exist and if the devil did not exist. But guess what? There is a devil and evil things exist. So you know how you're going to get your joy? You need to railroad through it. Railroad through it and get that peace and joy at the end. Don't try to live in the devil's lie anymore. You're just growing the pain. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open. Don't dance with the devil. Don't be a demon deluded Christian. Some of you are demonically deluded. You may not be demon possessed, but you're demonically deluded. Why? The delusion is you don't see the devil in the way you act, the way you talk, the way you live, and then 
the things that you have so much pain in your heart and life, so many complaints to the Lord. Hey, you're blaming the wrong person. You're not looking at the devil. This is his system. That's why there's unfairness. That's why there's so much pain and sacrifice and it's hard to serve the Lord. Why? This is the devil's world. The Bible says in whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto him. It's his job to make you miserable, go through pain, make it hard for you to serve God, make it hard for you to fight against him. Why? Because he doesn't want you to attain the peace and the joy and the blessing he get, that Jesus Christ offers. So it's his job to keep you deluded, keep you blinded. Again, the Bible says, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Do you see a devil in your home? Do you see a devil going on within your family? Do you see a devil going on in your thinking, in your life? You lack patience. You lack charity. You lack endurance. You lack leadership and wisdom to do it effectively. You know why? You don't see a devil in your system. You don't see a devil in this church. You don't see a devil where in the middle of fellowship, he's going to start something all of a sudden. In the tech, in the online work that we're doing. You don't see a devil there is a devil. If you realize his system, his plans, and his worlds, you would build up tenacity to fight even harder. You know why I didn't quit? Because I know there is a devil. And when attacks and hardships happen in my household, in my life, and personally, in my mentally, mental thoughts, and in my church, the way I live, you know what? I think about, I know why. There is a devil he wants me to quit. He wants me to throw in the towel. I ain't going down without a fight. I'm going to go through it. And guess what? God rewards me every time. And he pulls me through every time. I've said this before, but before online we got popular and the subscribers grew, we were so small we didn't get any attention. It was at that time the devil attacked me very hard and I was going to quit. I almost quit. I almost quit. There was only one thing in my mind, though, is the enemies of the Lord, is the devil. How they would rejoice over my dead carcass, that they would control this place and damn souls to hell. And I was like, I can't. I can't. God, my Father, I pray that there won't be any demon-deluded Christians here, let alone demon-possessed Christians. I pray that we've been more aware of his devices and we will arm ourselves according to Ephesians 6. This is spiritual warfare, Father. Before we whine, complain, and so easily blame you or the situation or other people around us or this preaching, make us first see the devil and realize this is his world, his game, his system. How easy we fall to blame you and others rather than the evil one who wants us to live a miserable life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.